Brexit is now less than six weeks away. How do you rate the chances of Britain leaving with a deal? I had a meeting with uh, Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister. This was a rather positive uh, meeting, uh, although the British press was reporting it in the other way. Um, we can we can have a deal. Do you think we can get a deal? I think. You think that the chances are more than 50-50? I don't know. But uh, I'm doing everything to have a deal because I don't like the idea of no deal because this would have catastrophic uh, uh, consequences. It's better, and for Britain and for the European Union, to have a, a, an organised deal. Is, is the EU ready for a no deal? For? For a no deal. Yeah, we are, we, we are prepared. A no deal uh, uh, for at least one year. Because uh, in Britain, ministers, prime ministers are saying, OK, there is no deal, there will be no deal. And we, we are prepared for that. And, and I hope that Britain is prepared as well. The UK, I'm not so sure, by, by the way. The UK has submitted some written ideas. Have you received them? What have you received? We have received uh, some documents uh, yesterday night. I, I had no chance, no opportunity to take them on the meditation, but I will do this tonight. Do you think that they are serious I ideas? Don't know. I, I, I didn't see them because they, they were sent to us uh, lately, but I, I had uh, the Prime Minister on the phone, and I do think that uh, on that basis things are possible. What is it that the UK government is suggesting? Yeah, but I, I haven't seen it. But you've spoken to Boris Johnson. I have spoken to Boris Johnson without knowing the content of the British proposals. And so I'm not able to speak of uh, this British proposal with the highest authority because I didn't see it. But you must know the direction. No, I don't know the direction. I, I was asking the Prime Minister when he was there in uh, Luxembourg the other day, to make concrete uh, proposals as far as the so-called alternative arrangements are uh, concerned, allowing us and Britain to achieve the main objectives of the backstop. I, I don't have an erotic relation to the backship, uh, to the backstop. But if the results are there, I don't care about the instrument. So the backstop could go if the objectives no, are met? If, if the objectives are met, all of them, then uh, we don't need the backstop. But because anyway, backstop was a guarantee instrument, and not an instrument, an aim by itself. What we're hearing in the UK is that one of the ideas is for Northern Ireland to follow EU rules on food and agriculture, and then for other checks to be done away from the border. Do you think that's a basis of a deal? It's a basis. You think that's the starting point? Starting and the arrival point. Are there other problems that you see? Yeah, but uh, when it comes to the internal market, the internal market has to be preserved in its entirety. There are many problems we have uh, to address, uh, not only uh, those you are mentioning. And do you think the withdrawal agreement could be reopened? No, it will not be reopened. Because I was told by the former Prime Minister, uh, my good friend Theresa May, that this is the only deal possible. It's the only deal possible, and that's the reason why I'm saying that it's a backstop or not backstop, if uh, the alternative arrangements, which can be envisaged, are serving the same objectives, then it can be done. But, but if I, I said today, withdrawal agreement is a piece of paper, no. It was a treaty. I, I don't like this way the British have to describe what we agreed upon as a deal. A deal. But what does that mean? It was a treaty. We concluded the treaty. But it was rejected the... three times yeah, by yeah. Parliament. And it, it won't pass. Yeah, and we we have Westminster, which is a parliament. I deeply respect them. This parliament, of course, has to agree. And we have the European Parliament. Don't forget that there is a parliament on the continent too, which has to agree. It's not only to, up to Westminster to agree. 
after having had an agreement by Westminster, we need the agreement of the European Parliament. But I don't understand if the withdrawal agreement has been rejected three times by Westminster, and you are saying that it won't be reopened. How there can be a deal? Yeah, you know, this is a good question for Westminster. So the EU is not moving? I was explaining again and again that if the alternative arrangements allow us to achieve the same goals, then we don't need uh, the backstop. But we have to save the entirety of the internal market. We have to make sure that there will be no uh, hard uh, and physical border in uh, between the two parts of uh, uh, the Irish uh, island. And uh, things have to be done in, on a uh, level playing field. If these three objectives are met by the alternative arrangements, then we don't need the backstop. The backstop was never an instrument having been put in place for whatever will happen. No, it was put in place in order to preserve the uh, rights of the internal market and of the island uh, of, uh, of Ireland. How do you think the EU would feel about another extension? That's not our problem. Uh, the, the Prime Minister was very outspoken by saying that he would not ask for an extension. So this is uh, a theoretical question. And, and he repeated to me several times that he will not ask a further extension. So why should I uh, reflect on that if the Prime Minister is saying that they will not do that? And do you think that there is a chance that Brexit might not happen? That's not my... Uh, scenario, I, I'm convinced that uh, Brexit uh, will happen. You think it's going to happen? I think so. Um, I want to just look for a minute at what happens if Britain leaves without a deal. Would there be a border between Ireland, Northern Ireland and the Republic? Yes. There would be a border? Yes. Um, and what would that mean? Does that mean infrastructure at the border? But I will not step I myself, I will not I'm not an architect of new uh, uh, border stations. The British have to uh, tell us exactly the architectural nature of this uh, border. I don't like this, that border because after the Good Friday, Friday Agreement, and this Friday uh, Agreement has to be respected in all its parts, the situation in uh, Ireland has improved. We should not play with this. Yeah, as you say, the history of that border, we all know the history of the yeah, border. Yeah. No, I, I, sometimes I have the impression that uh, some people are forgetting about the history. Like but who? history will be back immediately. Who do you if, mean? Oh, some uh, members of the British uh, uh, Parliament are not criticising them. I have the highest respect possible for Westminster because it's the mother of the parliaments, although not being in session. The UK government says that it won't put up a border, even if there isn't a deal. Yeah. So the EU will insist on a border. We have to make sure that uh, the interests of the European Union and of the internal market will be preserved. A, an animal entering Northern Ireland without border control can enter without any kind of control the European Union via the southern part of the Irish island. This will not happen. We have to preserve uh, the um, health and the safety of uh, uh, our citizens. I understand the importance of the single market, the internal market, but to put up a border uh, is something that many people would be incredibly worried about, given the history, the yeah, deaths yeah. and that border. I mean, is that something the EU would be responsible for? The EU is in no way responsible for any kind of consequences entailed. But the Brexit, that's a British decision, a sovereign decision we are respecting. But don't try, not you, but to um, uh, charge the European Union with responsibility. The European Union is not leaving the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom is leaving the European Union. So who, who is responsible? The United Kingdom. Because we did not invent the Brexit. We were never pleading in favour of any kind of Brexit. That's a British decision. And so 
it has to be dealt with in that way. Do you hold David Cameron responsible? He called the referendum? He was not the only one, but he's uh, responsible for that. He's a good friend of mine, by the way. But And uh, we agreed a deal uh, back in 2016, I think, between uh, David and uh, ourselves. But this deal was never explained to the British public. Never. What about Jeremy Corbyn? What do you make of Labour's position? He's well, said that he may try and negotiate a deal if he was Prime Minister, put it to a second referendum, and then maybe not even campaign for it. That's a British, an inner British uh, uh, question. I, I'm, I'm not interfering in this non-debate between the two. Okay. Um, now, to go back to the EU, um, you clearly uh, put responsibility to the UK. Um, this week, though, the Prime Minister of Luxembourg held a press conference uh, next to an empty podium where Boris Johnson was supposed to be. Is that helpful? I don't know if this is helpful. I rather consider that this was not very helpful, but it's his decision. He's my, my successor, so I will not comment on this uh, behaviour, but... I myself, I had a good meeting with uh, Boris Johnson, polite, friendly, um, positive in uh, many uh, aspects. And I liked the conversation I had with uh, uh, the Prime Minister. It was not a meeting between two enemies. It was a meeting between friends. Because some reports say that actually at that meeting you later said but it was the first time you think he understood the single market. Yeah, I, I was reading that in the FT, I think. Yes, that's right. That's wrong. So you, you no, don't no, think no, that no, he no. Did, misunderstood the complexities? No, 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 no. Um, just again, we were explaining some uh, dimension of the internal market, but I did not have the impression that he was discovering this while listening. Just to go back to my question on the Luxembourg Prime Minister, that the reason that I asked it is because for many people in Britain, it really sums up why they have an issue with the EU, what they don't like about the EU, what is perceived as an arrogant treatment of the United Kingdom. I don't know if this was arrogant, it was not necessary, and I do think that this, the feeling you are describing existed even before the visit of uh, Boris Johnson to Luxembourg. And actually, for some people, you are the face of what they have a problem with with the EU. But they see I, you as the Brussels bogeyman, yeah, yeah, uh, unaccountable, but, okay, unelected. Uh, you cannot... That's a typical British lie. What is I'm, it? I'm elected by the, by, the, by the European Parliament. And what, what does That's it make a you Parliament feel? Tool. Does it make you the feel Parliament angry? The Parliament does not only exist uh, in Westminster. The European Parliament was voting on me and was voting on the Commission. I was a Prime Minister for 19 years. I have uh, three or four other Prime Ministers in my uh, team. I have uh, so many uh, former Ministers of Foreign Affairs or Defence Everyone, a part of British commissioner, has been elected. Someone, somewhere, someday. So stop this nonsense, this Farage nonsense. Does it make you angry? No, 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 but I'm, I'm, I'm no longer uh, in a mood to listen to uh, uh, these stories that we are unelected, putschists, uh, unreasonable uh, guys. We are there where we are because people put us there. Your term as the Commission President comes to an end at the 31st of October, the same day as Brexit. Do you think yeah. that sentiment... That's a quiz. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Do you think that people have more or less faith in the European Parliament and in the EU now than when you first Listen, got the job? I, I'm not a strong believer in opinion polls. I don't like them. All those, my results in the opinion polls were always even better than my election results in uh, uh, Luxembourg, according to the last opinion poll, I have an approval rate of 90%, so they can't be right. <coughs> the last opinion polls in all the countries apart Britain are showing that uh, uh, the citizens uh, have become, after Brexit, stronger believers in the European Union uh, than uh, before. The approval rate of the European Union and of the institutions is higher than it was uh, uh, before uh, Brexit, which is quite astonishing. Is it astonishing? No. People have seen what can happen if a country decides uh, uh, to leave. 
And what I wanted to tell the British public and uh, your audience is that I have no sense of revenge. I will always admire Britain because the place this uh, great nation has in Europe will not uh, disappear with, uh, with Brexit. The European continent owes a lot to Britain. What is it that you like about Britain? What I do like? Yeah. You know, I was born after the Second World War, as visibly you were. <coughs> but in my country, this small country, Luxembourg, there is this remaining feeling that uh, Britain did resist more than others, before others and after others, to the uh, Nazi regime the Germans wanted to impose on the, on the rest of Europe. Luxembourg was invaded like the Netherlands and like Belgium on the 10th of May 1940, and the only ones who immediately took our defense, not only by lip service, but by paying lip service, but by doing things which had to be done, were the British. And so, Brexit or not Brexit, I will always love it. And Guy Verhofstadt of the Euro European Parliament spoke at Lib Dem conference in the United Kingdom and he said the world of tomorrow is a world of empires in which we European and you British can only defend your interests, your way of life, by doing it together in a European framework. Do you think it's a world of empires? Yeah, but I, I don't like this expression, empires. I don't know what it means. It, it sounds rather aggressive, military, but the truth is that uh, as European countries, given the uh, new competitors we have uh, uh, worldwide, the European countries have to stick together. You should not forget that at the beginning of the 20th century, 25% of the world population was European. Now, 7. By the end of this century, 4% out of 10 billion. The European continent is anyway the smallest. Europeans don't know it, but we are a very small uh, continent, very complicated one, as we know. As we know. And our relative uh, uh, economic weight is uh, disappearing. We, we have now a, a share of the uh, global GDP of 25%. In uh, 20 years from now, it will be 15, 16. Is this the moment to separate or is this the moment to stand uh, together? That's the reason why I'm unhappy about uh, Brexit. That's the reason why I do want to have an as close relationship as possible with this uh, proud nation called United Kingdom. I, uh, I used to say there are only two big states in Europe, the Great Duchy of Luxembourg and Great Britain. And just finally, while I've got you, you were talking before about your, the kind of unfair portrayal of you uh, in the newspapers in, in Britain. And sometimes you're portrayed as a bit of a bon viveur, the sort of person who ruffles women's hair at press conferences. Oh, yeah, Is that what you're like? No, that's what I'm doing. But uh, I was very much surprised when I saw this story of uh, the hairs of uh, uh, my deputy chief protocol. It was the wind, it was not 